very exciting edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. We're here with astronaut Colonel Ron Guerin, amazing American. Fantastic to have you on, sir. Thank you so much. Hey, Alex. Great, great to be here. Uh, the pleasure is all ours. So let's start with what got you into flight and space. Yeah. So let's see. It's uh, I didn't want to be a pilot or, or an astronaut my whole life. It was only since July 20th, 1969, uh, where, I, as, really? <laughs> yeah, where I, as a small boy, along with millions and millions of people around the world, watched those first footsteps on the moon from the first moon landing. And, uh, you know, that kind of served as a calling um, for me to, to try and follow in those footsteps. And, uh, uh, you know, I had a really strong desire to uh, step off the planet and uh, look back on ourselves and and uh, just see see the earth from space and so that set up a long lifelong journey um, which uh, took me to the Air Force uh, flew for 26 years uh, with the United States Air Force became a, a fighter pilot a test pilot um, flew in combat during Operation Desert Storm uh, and then I was selected from the ranks of test pilots uh, to become an astronaut and then uh, uh, on, in 2008, uh, I flew my first mission and uh, my childhood dream of flying in space came true. Wow. Were you more scared going to space or on the F-16? Uh, well, in both cases, uh, I was going into a hostile environment. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, in the case of flying in combat in the F-16, it was a hostile environment where people were actively trying to kill me. That wasn't the case in the in space, in space, we had people, thousands and thousands of people actively trying to keep me alive. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, both, both, both situations, I think, had their, their danger and their, and their apprehension associated with it. But in both cases, um, both situations had a tremendous uh, benefit, a payoff, a risk benefit trade off, uh, if you will. Uh, and um, in both cases, there was a, you know, a reason for, for doing it. In one case, it was liberation of Kuwait. And in the other case, it was the, you know, expanding human knowledge of our, our universe and our place in the universe. So did you go to the International Space Station in 2008? Yeah, the, my first mission was on Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, we launched from the Kennedy Space Center and we brought up and installed the Japanese laboratory to the International Space Station. So it was basically a space station construction mission. Well, let's talk about the shuttle for a second. You know, we had astronaut Mike Mullane on about two weeks ago, and he is a huge critic of the space shuttle, uh, from its uh, tiles to the actual uh, rockets themselves and how they're put together. Um, were you a critic as well of the space shuttle? Uh, I was a tremendous fan of the space shuttle. I think it's one of the most... Uh, uh, inventive and creative uh, technical accomplishments that we as a nation have ever ever accomplished. That having said all that, there were limitations to it. It was not the safest vehicle. It was very complex. Uh, it required, you know, had a lot of moving parts. It it, it, had, it needed a lot of uh, um, maintenance and overhaul between missions. It never lived up to. Uh, the promise of having routine, inexpensive, safe uh, access to, to low Earth orbit. Um, but we have an International Space Station that would not have been possible uh, had it not been for the, for the space shuttle, you know, tw 20 well, what, missions. What, to, that promise is not realistic. I mean, the, the idea of doing what we wanted to do, wasn't that just not realistic at all? The idea that we could have like a shuttle, really? I'm not sure I understand what your question is. At the time, our technology wasn't strong enough for space missions to have a shuttle that could go every two weeks, which is what it was originally planned to do. Yeah, that, that was certainly the case. And um, I, I'm not, it was, I don't think it was, uh, the shuttle was not a mistake. I think the shuttle was a, was a pro propelled us forward in our ability to, to live and work in space, um, so particularly in low earth orbit. Like I said, it built the space station. And, and so that's part of its legacy. It has a tremendous legacy. Um, but I, and I don't think it's wrong to push the limits of our technical ability. And the shuttle certainly pushed the limits of our technical ability. And, um, and unfortunately, that led to, to a couple of disasters. Yeah, no, well, at the same time, you know, uh, a well-known kind of tidbit that I've heard from a number of people in NASA is that if you were ever to, you know, open the side uh, hatch and say, hey, guys, God called, there's this 50-50 chance it's going to blow up, no one's going to jump out of uh, the mission. They'll still want to go forward. So the, the, you know, the desire to push the envelope is something that I guess goes hand in hand with working at NASA. You know, 
Is that the new? No, I don't think that's a true statement at all. Oh, I you think, don't? Okay, great. No, I don't. I don't. I, I think there's very few people. Well, I love this. Again, every. This is, this is why I do the program to learn. This is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, so everything comes down to a, a, you know, a risk benefit trade-off, right? A, a risk mitigation strategy. And I think back in the Apollo days when they were doing, certainly like Apollo 8, the first mission to the moon, and you know, some of the later missions. Uh, yeah, the, I, I think if you did an, an accurate estimate of what the probability of uh, failure was and, and, and losing the crew, it was probably... Uh, they probably thought it was around 50-50 at the time. Uh, I don't know. They probably have some way to figure out exactly what it was, but to get on, but there was something, there, there was something very, very time critical about that, that we were in a space race, right? And it was seen yeah. as a, 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 a mission of national security. And so that made the, the, the risk tolerance of those missions uh, go up way higher than a, than a routine shuttle mission where we're launching a satellite. I don't think anybody would get on a shuttle with a 50-50 chance of it blowing up to launch a satellite. Um, so, or at least <laughs> not any rational person. Um, but I mean, it, th having said that, it was still a very high chance of, of catastrophe. Uh, it wasn't 50-50 though. So what, what would you say the, the odds were of catastrophe on every- on and The every odds were uh, one in whatever half of 135 are. Because <laughs> oh, really? we, okay. we flew 135 missions and uh, we lost two. So, so yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the odds come to about uh, one and a half percent. So, uh, that's, uh, yeah, th those aren't, uh, those aren't terrible, but those are obviously still extremely dangerous. When you consider that what an English bombardier in, in, in World War II had, what, a 50 50 chance of surviving their first like four missions, there was some, some aw awful numbers. So, um, at the same time, if you were offered another spot to go back to the moon or to go to the moon, would you like to take it at this point in your life or are you past space or how do you feel? Well, certainly, go to, certainly to go to the moon, but I made a conscious decision to, to leave NASA um, and leave my dream job. And the reason why I did is because uh, at this point in my life, it's all about unique impact. Uh, and I define unique impact as impact that wouldn't happen if I didn't do it. And so there was all kinds of things, including sharing this perspective of our planet unencumbered uh, by being a civil servant uh, or a member, member of the US government, uh, which I think was unique impact. And so at the time I was thinking to myself, yeah, would I like to fly in the space station mission? I would love to. Uh, there's a whole long line of people, of astronauts waiting to fly their first mission even. Um, if I you know, stayed around, I would just be taking one of their spots if I leave and pursue these other um, unique opportunities to provide unique impact, um, NASA's not going to miss a beat. They're not, they're not really going to miss me. It's not going to create any real negative impact to the program. So, um, so I set out and, and, and did that. Yeah. So what about Mars? Do you want to go to Mars? Yeah, I would, I would love to go to Mars. I wouldn't go to Mars on a one-way trip. No. Um, but just going, going back to your question, uh, moon is, the, going to the moon is a whole other story. <laughs> So, because so, I, I mean, that was my uh, dream to, to, go, to follow in the footsteps of the Apollo astronauts. And so I would probably do the same uh, uh, calculus, though. I would probably look at does the, does the country and uh, does the world need me to do that? Is there something unique that I can offer? Uh, and if there was, I would, I would pursue it. Um, if it was 50 50, like, like <laughs> yeah, I can, uh, someone else can probably do it just as good, but, uh, you know, uh, do I want to take a shot? I would, I would definitely do it because um, it's, you know, a lifelong dream. And, and um, to answer your question about Mars, I would go to Mars as well, but uh, not on a one-way trip. Because um, there are people I talk about, you know, going on a one-way trip. What about the pursuit of aliens and the Big Bang? Has astrophysics ever been something that's appealed to you? Yeah, of course. I mean, understanding our place in the universe. Um, are we, for instance, are we alone in the universe? How does the you know, how did, it, how did it all get here? Where's it all going? You know, all of that. I mean, those are really important questions. And, and actually, a lot of those questions are uh, some of the themes of my uh, upcoming book that uh, should be published hopefully by, by the end of the year, uh, this fall called Floating in Darkness. Yes, tell us more about this book. Yeah, so I, I, used a, a metaf I used an autobiographical narrative, my own life story, as a metaphor for the evolution of society. Not only where we've been, but where we need to go. And um, I, I kind of make the observation in the book that 
Um, there are fundamental issues that need to be solved. There's fundamental root cause problems that need to be overcome. Uh, and I you know, identify those and we talk about those. And until we really address our root cause problems of- Can you give us uh, an example or two, please? Yeah, if I can finish my thought, I'm happy to do that. But as we, as we, you know, look at the root cause problems, we'll we will do nothing more than um, slap band aids on our problems. We're we're going to still have, you know, these intractable problems uh, unless we we go to the root cause. And so, um, part of the root cause is that we have this false sense of separation. We have a, this idea that. Uh, we as individuals, we as corporations, we as governments, we as whatever sports fans, whatever, we all exist in these little stovepipes and these in these little, you know, cubby holes in our in our simplified framework that we've built to to view the world uh, through, and that's not the case at all. What what's really uh, very very apparent from the vantage point of space is that we all are profoundly not only interconnected but interdependent, and you can't. You know, operate things as if they're, you know, isolated self-serving entities in a vacuum, you know, like businesses, for instance, businesses don't operate in a vacuum. They, they're interdependent with everything else on the planet and including the resources of the planet and the environment of the planet and the life support systems of the planet. Uh, and it's all, it's all deeply, deeply interconnected and interdependent. Um, and that's the way we, that's the true reality of the world. And we have real, real problems and challenges that we face. And the only way that we'll solve them is through ad addressing them in the context of the real world. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree with you. There's, it's tough though when you've got uh, divided nation states, autonomous nation states. It's tough to make them listen to one another and to, you know, enact you know rules that you know, kind of everyone should you know seemingly live by. You know that uh, you know, that can be a, a, a terrible yeah I, almost I, impossible. I, I, yeah, but I think there, there's nothing wrong with nation states in America included pursuing what's in their best interest but they need to pursue what's in their best interest in the context of the rest of the world with an understanding, a multi-level, multi-dimensional <laughs> understanding of the interrelated, interdependent nature of, of their actions and what, and what effects and second order, third order, fourth order effects occur through those actions. We, we, don't, we don't, isolationism is no longer, it never was, it's certainly no, you know, not a, a, a realistic path. Should NASA then be, should all of the global national space agencies be one? I mean, should the Chinese space agency and the U.S. space agency, should they all become one space agency? Is that something of what you're talking about here? I, I don't know that they should become one space agency, but I think they should be working together collaboratively. And we are through the International Space Station Par Partnership, uh, not China. China was prohibited from joining that. Uh, um, so, but I think. Why was uh, China prohibited from joining that? Uh, because the U.S. didn't want them in um, because of all the problems uh, that politicians and, and folks have with uh, the way that uh, Chinese operates, the, the Chinese government operates. And this is a really important point. And this is, this is part of what I'm bringing out in the book, The Flowing in Darkness, is what we tend to do, and this is a perfect example of it, is we tend to find those things that we agree upon, which in this case is space exploration, right? The awe and wonder of exploring, you know, our universe through space exploration. We take those things that we agree upon and we use them as a stick to force the things that we don't agree on. So for, for instance, when we were talking about having the Russians join the International Space Station uh, program, there were many, many people who objected to that saying, you know, you know X, Y, and Z, until the Russians stopped doing X, Y, and Z, we can't, we can't do any business with them, right? So luckily, fortunately, those voices didn't win out and we brought the Russians into the International Space Station program. By the way, after um, the Columbia um, uh, mishap, the Columbia uh, uh, catastrophe, uh, we would have had to shut down the space station had it not been for our partnership with the Russians. But what happened is personal relationships develop, a platform of trust develops within the space program, and then that becomes a platform that we can jump off from and start to address the things that we don't agree on. Now, that those voices won out in the discussion with bringing China into, into a partnership. The, 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 the voices that said that we, we need to use this to force the things that we don't agree on. First of all, that never works. Uh, but a proven path to success is to find the low-hanging fruit, find the thing, the common ground, find the things that we do agree on, and then use that as a jump-off point to address the things that we don't agree on. 
China is going to do amazing things in space. They're going to do them with or without us. Uh, if, if, if they do it with us, we'll know, we'll have a better insight into not only what they're doing, but why they're doing it. And I think it's a path, path towards peace. It's a path towards stability. Uh, it is, it's the path that we should take. We should, we should uh, be joining together in profound collaboration around the most amazing thing that we do as humans, uh, one of the most amazing things in that space exploration. Wow, yeah, no, I actually, I couldn't agree more with you. I, you know, why would we not want to partner with China and gain whatever knowledge they have and say, okay, here's what we have, take it, take to whatever you want with it. Uh, the idea that, you know, we are not working with China to me just seems uh, ludicrous. You know, we at Rebellion Research the last few years have been covering a lot of the work that the Chinese space uh, organization has done and they've been tr devoting tremendous resources, man hours, and they're surely making strides that we haven't made yet. And so the idea that you know, we're not going to, you know, have that, you know, stimulus from the Chinese brain is, uh, it, it's, it's, I agree, it, it's sad. Well, it's, one, uh, of the big, one of the big things bringing, you know, partners with uh, diverse perspectives into this is, is the fact that they're coming in with diverse perspectives. They're seeing things from a, d a different angle. One of the things we learned from our partnership with the Russians is they have a completely different engineering approach than we do. And it turns out that the difference in our engineering approach and their engineering approach is very complementary. We make up for, for uh, lack that they have in their approach and they make up for lack that we have in our approach. And it, and it really makes us stronger as a partnership. And, and the more we learn to work together, the stronger we are as a species. Uh, no, definitely, definitely. Uh, true words haven't been said. Well, Astronaut, this was an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for coming on today. I, uh, I really pleasure. appreciate this. So your, your book that's coming out in a few months, let's talk about that one last time before we go. Yeah, it's called Floating in Darkness. It's, a, it's a, more or less a sequel to my first book, The Orbital Perspective, um, but it goes much, much deeper. And it, it not only does it talk about outer space, it talks a lot about inner space too. So. <laughs> and these will be available on Amazon? Yeah, it'll be on bookstores everywhere, yeah. Awesome. Well, everyone, please go out and buy the new book and the old book. Astronaut, thank you so much. You're the best. Thank you, Alex.